Okay, just to summarize, uh, if we have n bits, this corresponds to 2 to the n possibilities. And we'll always call 2 to the little n, we'll always define this to be big N, <laughs> if we have a little n. Now, if we have big N possibilities, where n could be 3, so it's not 2 to some integer, this corresponds to log to the base 2 of n bits, which doesn't have to be a number. For instance, log to the base 2 of 3 is between 1 and 2 bits. I guess it's still a number, but it's not a natural number. <clears throat> then we also looked at probabilities. So if the frequency of heads is m sub h over m, the total of number of, if I have a sequence with heads and tails, I count the total number of heads, I count the number of total number of tails, I define this to be q of heads, and I define q of tails, this is equal to 1 minus the frequency of tails, because it's either heads of tails, where our coins are not landing on their coiner, their, their sides, and just staying there like that, so or their edges. <clears throat> then the total number of sequences, actually we'll write it like this, the logarithm to the base 2 of the number of sequences with frequency qh for heads and qt of tails, this is equal to uh, minus q of h log to the base 2 of q of h minus q of t log to the base 2 of q of t, and we define this just to be the amount of information or entropy in such sequences. And if the logarithm of this number is equal to this, that implies that the total number of such sequences, that is sequences with this frequency, is equal to, or approximately equal to, two, sorry, there's an m here, told you to make mistakes as this went on, is two to the m times i, or two to the m times s. So this special formula, almost magical, but not magical, because it's just mathematical, this formula which shows up all the time in information theory, minus the sum of q log q or minus the sum of p log p is just a way of counting numbers of sequences if you're given a particular kind of frequency. So there's an intrinsic relationship between frequency, probability, and information, and that relationship is given by this formula. Okay, um, in a bit, maybe a lecture or two down the line, in these 10-minute lectures, uh, we'll talk about how to apply this fundamental formula about information theory to the problem of communication. How many bits of information can you send down a communication channel? For example, I'm talking right now, my larynx is wiggling, it's sending vibrations through the air, this is a physical system, information is being conveyed, but because it's a physical communication channel, there are physical limits to how much information I could probably communicate to you. Assuming, of course, you think I am communicating any information at all. Um, and these formulas, this fundamental formula of information theory, allows us to put limits on the capacity of any communication channel. Any communication, excuse me, any communication channel that's realized by a physical medium. And by gum, those are all the only, the only communication channels that I know about. But before we do this, let's talk about the relationship between information and computation. In other words, let's talk about 
information processing. This also goes under the name of computation. And it also goes under the name of Boolean logic. Boolean logic, what is Boolean logic? Well, George Boole was a 19th century logician who came up with Boolean logic. He actually was married to Mary Everest, who was the daughter of the uh, surveyor of the British Raj of the same name after whom Mount Everest is named. And Boole wrote a modestly titled book called The Laws of Thought. Very modest. He'd fit in right well with the same kind of modesty that goes on in the Santa Fe Institute nowadays. I'm sure we'd welcome him with open arms. So what is the content of Boole's Laws of Thought? Well, Boole was interested in logical propositions. And logical propositions can either be true or false. Um, and by the way, if we're going to map this onto the way computers do this, often we call true one and false zero. This is just a convention. Those of you who are more fond of zero than one can have the opposite convention if you like, but I'm going to adopt this convention right here. So Boole was interested in questions like, suppose I have a proposition X. So X is, it's sunny. And I have another proposition Y. And Y is, for example, it's raining. So either it's sunny or it's not sunny. So it could be true that it's sunny or could it be false that it's sunny. It could be true that it's raining or it's false that it's raining. And Boole is interested in propositions of the form X and Y. X and Y means that it's sunny and it's raining. Now, actually, where Boole lived in Ireland was probably usually false. Usually false in this case. <laughs> in this case. And he was also interested in propositions like X or Y. Um, now, either it's sunny or it's raining. Um, it could also be cloudy and not raining. So sometimes true. Um, <clears throat> and he was also interested in propositions like if X, then not why. So if it's sunny, then it's not raining. Probably largely true. So he will want it to break down logical statements into, into propositions of this form, using ideas like x and y, that a proposition is true if and only if its constituents are true, x or y, this proposition is true if and only if one or more of its constituents are true, or more complicated propositions like if x, then not y, which is some Boolean function of its constituent propositions. So here is a glorious fact. So <clears throat> if I say x and y, I write this as x uh, cap y, x and y, x or y, I can write this as x cup y. This is, this is the notation that Boole developed. Not x, I write this as x with a little twiddle in front of it to say that it's not true. It's the twiddle, the twiddled version. If x, then y. 
Well, I write this as x implies y, so if x is true, then y is true. Then Boole had a beautiful theorem that says any possible logical expression can be written down in terms of composing these kinds of propositions. So for example, um, uh, uh, x, I'll do it like this, x and y or not, I'll use a twiddle, sorry, or having introduced a notation, now I'm, I'm violating it, x and y or not x implies y and uh, uh, x or not y. Now, I have no idea what this means, this logical expression, but it is some expression, and what Boole gave is a set of rules to evaluate when such expressions could be true and when they're not true. So if I just write this, speak this out in terms of sunny and raining, it's, if it's sunny and it's raining or it's not sunny, then it's raining and it is sunny or not raining. Sounds false to me. <laughs> but <clears throat> what Boole showed is that any possible logical proposition could be written in this way. And this is why he modestly entitled his book The Laws of Thought, because he was interested in logic he noted that any possible logic proposition could be written out in terms of these simple rules. And here is a even more remarkable fact. And the fact is, and this is not a mid 19th century thing. This is a beginning of the 21st century thing. All digital computers are doing so the only thing that they're doing is evaluating such Boolean expressions a computer just breaks up things into operations and we can have an operation this is how I write the same kind of thing in computer language this says x and y. This is x and y, and this is what's called an AND gate. An AND gate is simply a device in a computer that takes in the inputs x and y, which are 0 and 1, and it outputs x and y. And this is equal to 1 if and only if x is equal to 1, y is equal to 1. Otherwise, it's equal to 0. Similarly, we have an OR gate, which is written like this, x, y, and the output is x or y. This is equal to 1 if x or y is equal to 1, and it's equal to 0 if x is equal to 0 and y is equal to 0. It's a physical device that implements this logical operation OR. The AND gate is something that implements the physical operation AND. And then we have something that Im implements NOT X. So NOT X is equal to 0 if X is equal to 1. And it's equal to 1 if X is equal to 0. So this is AND or NOT. And the final operation is a copy operation. So I take X and I make two copies of it. So these are the computer digital versions of Boolean logic. They are actually physical devices that implement Boole's universal laws of thought. Mind you, I, there are plenty of ways of thinking that I do and that other people do and that dogs and cats do that do not obviously, uh, uh, that cannot obviously be broken down into this Boolean logic. So I'm not sure how universal it is. 
We have these four different kinds of gates, and, or, not, and copy. And now here is a remarkable thing. So Boole's theorem, his universal theorem, says that when we can apply it to computers, any set of digital logic operations That is to say, anything that a digital computer, what a digital computer can do, including your iPhone, or if you're a smartphone person, an Android person, your Android phone, I don't wish to be company-esque here, um, can be broken down into AND, AND operations, sorry, which look like this in computer science lingo, or operations, which looks like this, not operations, which are written like this for some historical reasons, and copy operations, which are written like this. So all your smartphone is doing, all your computer is doing, is breaking down logical processes and information processing into fundamental units of combining these operations of and, or, not, and copy. And as George Boole showed in the 1840s and 50s, it's possible to break down any kind of logical expression into the set of operations. So we have information, we have bits, we have ways of processing and transforming those information, um, or that information, sorry. Uh, using elementary physical systems, which are logic gates, and all that digital computation is doing is combining these sets of operations in arbitrarily complicated ways.